In this video, we will discuss radial basis function networks. Radial basis functions are no longer quite as popular in the modern era. However, during the era of support vector machines, these methods were very popular. In fact, radial basis function networks represent a generalization of support vector machines. Radial basis function networks are fundamentally different from uh, other types of neural networks because they have one layer, a hidden layer, which is trained in an unsupervised way. In this video, we will discuss the details of radial basis function networks and their relationship to support vector machines. Radial basis function networks represent a fundamentally different paradigm in neural networks. Throughout this lecture, we will refer to uh, a radial basis function network as an RBF network. RBF networks are not deep learners. They often use a single hidden layer and the single hidden layer is trained in unsupervised fashion. The way in which the hidden layer is trained in radial basis function networks is fundamentally different from modern deep learners. Modern deep learners represent an exercise in supervised feature engineering in which back propagation is used in order to train all the layers. RBF networks are closely related to SVMs and specifically kernel SVMs. This is because kernel SVMs can be shown to be a special case of RBF networks. And like kernel SVMs, RBF networks are universal function approximators. So, uh, in what case do we use RBF networks? Uh, and in what case do we use modern deep uh, neural networks? The, the modern, uh, the, the, the deep networks that are used in the modern era, they work best when the data has very rich structure. So for example, images, which don't have a lot of noise, but they have very integrate, intricate structure. And uh, this type of structure is best learned with hierarchical and supervised feature engineering. On the other hand, RBF networks work best when the data is noisy, but the structure is less intricate. Uh, in these cases, the unsupervised feature engineering methods of RBF networks are robust to noise. So let's uh, discuss the basic structure of an RBF network. The basic structure of an RBF network contains a single unsupervised hidden layer with high dimensionality. Uh, it is very often the case, it doesn't, it is not necessary, but it is very often the case that the hidden layer has a dimensionality M, which is much greater than the dimensionality of the input layer, which is denoted by D. The output layer might, uh, is, is often, for example, if you're performing linear regression, it might be a simple linear output layer. And uh, the, each hidden unit contains a prototype vector and an activation that depends on the similarity of the input to the prototype. Now, note this is this is very similar to the concept of kernel similarity. In fact, the way in which we will compute the similarity, it is the Gaussian RBF similarity, which is very similar to the Gaussian RBF kernel. So, in fact, the way in which we, uh, we perform the activation in the hidden units in the case of the RBF network is again fundamentally very different fr uh, from how we do it in a modern deep neural network. This notion that you have a prototype vector uh, in each hidden node and you use the similarity of uh, the, uh, the input to these prototype vectors in order to compute the activation, uh, it is fundamentally different than how uh, one performs matrix multiplication and uh, in uh, the case of uh, modern deep networks. In fact, uh, there are no weights on the edges between the input layer and the hidden layer in the case of the RBF network. So, uh, so, so let's look at the workings of the RBF network. So, so in this case, each of the M units has its own prototype vector mu i and uh, its own bandwidth sigma i. Now, it's very common to set each bandwidth of each hidden unit to, to be the same value sigma. Uh, but it doesn't, but it's not necessary. It is possible to have different bandwidths for different units, but it's not common. 
Now, the way in which the activations of the hidden units are computed is that for each input vector x, the activation hi of the hidden unit is given by the Gaussian RBF similarity of the input to the prototype vector of uh, that specific hidden unit. So think of a hidden unit as a specific region in the space, a specific densely populated region in the space, and the hidden unit gets activated if the point lies in that region of the space. And then once you compute this activation value, the output layer can either be a linear classifier or a regressor with weights wi. So the output layer, it's basically just you take all the hidden units, you, comp uh, you, you take wi, hi, and you sum it over... Uh, all the uh, hidden values. Now note that you can also apply a nonlinear activation function. So for example, you can apply a logistic activation function in the uh, output layer if you want to output a probability. That is possible in the output layer. So uh, how do RBF networks classify nonlinearly separable classes? Th th these methods, they essentially work with Covers principle of separability of patterns. So the idea here is that if you transform low dimensional data to high dimensional space, it leads to greater ease in linear separation. So if you go back to the slide which shows you the uh, architecture of the RBM network, you can see that uh, the dimensionality of the hidden layer is higher than that of the input layer. So now what you have done is that you have transformed the inputs to a new space with much higher dimensionality. This is very similar to what kernel SVMs do. They transform the points to a higher dimensional space. And now these hidden activations, you apply a simple uh, uh, linear separator uh, in the, based on the weights in the output layer. And now the prototypes, uh, you can view the prototypes in each hidden unit as a defining local influence region in the space. So in a sense, in each hidden unit, you have a prototype vector. So if an, if an input point is close to that prototype vector, the hidden unit will have a high activation value. Otherwise, the hidden unit will have an activation value which is very close to zero because of the use of the Gaussian RBF kernel. And the final uh, layer, what it does is that for each point, uh, certain hidden units gets activated and it puts each of these uh, 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 features on the appropriate side of the separator. So let's look at what this means in, a, in an actual example. Now imagine uh, that you had uh, two classes. So, so, so in the case of the distribution on the left, it's linearly separable. Now you could easily classify you, this using a perceptron. You don't need an RBF network for the uh, distribution on, on the left. But when you look at the distribution on the right, these are this is not a linearly separable uh, pattern because as you can see, the pluses, the class corresponding to pluses, and the class corresponding to stars, uh, they are, you, you just can't draw a line which separates these two. Now in the RBF network, now let's try to create an RBF network with just four hidden units. And uh, let's assume just uh, for the purpose of discussion that the centroid of each cluster is the prototype vector for the, each of the four hidden units. And let's say the bandwidth, the sigma is chosen in such a way that the activation, so, so if a point occurs from a cluster, the activation will be strongly positive only for, for, the di for the hidden units corresponding to that cluster and it will be almost zero for the other hidden units. So what is going to happen in this case? What is going to happen is that for any point which lies on the upper left cluster, the output will be positive only for the first component, it will be nearly zero for all the components. And similarly, for the uh, cluster on the upper right, uh, the representation of the hidden units is going to be uh, positive only for the second component and it will be going, going to be zero for the other uh, clusters. So what will happen is that every point will have a hidden representation in four dimensional space. Now, in this four dimensional space, if you pick the linear separator, uh, which is 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, you can show that in this four-dimensional space, it's linearly separable. 
So because you transformed it to higher dimensional space, uh, the, the points become separable. So uh, the way the Gaussian RBF network really works, uh, this already gives you the intuition on how it works. It decomposes the high dimensional space into smaller regions. And these smaller regions, it puts them together. It, it creates a dimension of its own. And in this higher dimensional space, the the classes are generally linearly separable. This is exactly how an SVM works. Now the training works in two phases. The uh, the, the the hidden layer uh, to, to train the hidden layer, you just need the prototype vectors and the bandwidth. So a prototype vector and the bandwidth are learned in an unsupervised manner. And then once you learn the uh, prototype vectors and the bandwidth in an unsupervised manner, you can learn the weights of the output layer in a supervised manner. So uh, and, and that is just a straightforward training of a single layer network with engineered features. So you you can if if you want you can even apply back propagation for the output. You in fact you don't even need back propagation because it's just a single layer. So. <clears throat> Now, for, for, for training the hidden layer, uh, there are various ways in which you can find the prototype uh, vectors as well as the bandwidth. The prototypes, they can be, for example, sampled for the data from the data, or they can be centroids of clusters. So you can apply a k-means clustering to the data, and you can choose the centroids as the prototypes of uh, the RBF network. Now, uh, there are several heuristics that are used for choosing the bandwidth, uh, one of which is uh, if Dmax is the maximum distance between pairs of prototypes, you can choose uh, the bandwidth to be Dmax divided by square root of m, where m is the number of hidden units, or if D average is the average distance between pairs of prototypes, it can be twice the average distance. Uh, or if you want, you can even tune the bandwidth of the validation data. So in this case, you're using, you are in fact using a mild level of supervision in order to train uh, at least one of the parameters of the hidden layer, which is the bandwidth. Now, uh, one interesting uh, aspect of uh, uh, RBF networks is that kernel methods are special cases of RBF networks. So uh, in this case, you just have to choose your hidden layer appropriately. So in this case, the each hidden layer, each hidden unit has a prototype, which is one of the points from your training data. So you will have exactly as many hidden units as the number of training points. And each hidden unit, its prototype is one training point. And the bandwidth exactly is like the bandwidth of your kernel as well. You can choose it to any value you want. And depending on how, how you pick your output layer, you can get different types of kernel methods. So if you use a linear output layer with squared loss, you will get kernel regression. Or uh, if, if you use a linear output layer with squared loss but binary targets, what you'll get is a Fisher discriminant. Uh, if you use a linear output layer with hinge loss, you will get an SVM. If you use a logistic output layer, so now in the output layer, you can in fact add a sigmoid activation and you can use a log loss. What you will get is kernel logistic regression. And the proofs of uh, all of these, they are given in the book. And now, one point is that in this case, uh, we used unsupervised feature engineering in order to train the hidden layer. So a question arises, can we really use supervised feature engineering to train the hidden layer? So generally, uh, there, there are a few methods to train the hidden layer with supervised method. In fact, the book discusses a few of these methods. But uh, generally, supervised feature engineering works well for deep neural networks, the modern types of neural networks. RBF networks, first of all, they are too shallow and they have a very large number of units. And uh, the main problem, of course, is the way in which the RBF uh, units, the hidden layer, computes its function. It uses this RBF function where uh, trying to learn the parameters of this RBF hidden layer, that is the prototypes and the bandwidth parameter, uh, it's too complicated a loss surface. The nature of the loss surface is such that you that it's very hard to learn it in a supervised manner. So so generally, uh, these methods have not been used in conjunction with supervision. In most cases, only mild levels of supervision are desired. For example, you can tune the bandwidth. And that is something you do in kernel SVMs too. Uh, or or uh, you can find the prototypes using some mild levels of supervision. So for example, you can use some mild forms of supervised clustering in order to find the prototypes. So, uh, but 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 there are a few supervised methods that are used to train the hidden layer, and the details of those are given in the book. Uh, 